Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at I'll Always Know What You Did Last Summer, released direct to video in 2006. This movie fucking sucks. The movie begins with some flashy editing that might be a problem for photosensitive viewers. And since they use it throughout this whole stupid fucking movie, maybe skip this one if you're seizure prone, or at least proceed with caution. We get some warpy mid-aughts rock that immediately makes you feel uneasy. Huh, got any lighter music movie? Maybe something that evokes a person laughing on a carnival ride. Perfect, just what I wanted. We're at a Colorado carnival in the town of Broken Ridge. Yes, this movie with a fisherman killer takes place in the landlocked state of Colorado. Go fucking figure. Here, Giggly Amber and her giggly friends <laughs> are giggling up a storm and telling each other urban legends. Which story you got lined up there, guy? The fisherman. <laughs> well, I hope he gets here soon, because I can't wait for these shitty characters to die. What about you, Zoe? I bet you got some dirty little secrets. Yeah, I heard you suck in bed. Ugh. <laughs> I'm really fucking covering this thing. Giggly Amber's boyfriend is Colby, who's played by David Paitko, previously seen on The Kill Count in Final Destination 2 as Fire Escape Guy, and AVP Requiem as Melty Face Guy. Good death resume, gotta say. I also love that Mr. Paitko knows exactly the kind of character he's playing here. Can you take a guy like this seriously? No, I cannot. But watch out, Colbster, because Tony Lance also has eyes for Amber. Back off, Lance, that's Colby. Colby's girl. He loves girls. He's definitely not gay. You want to play? <laughs> Whoa, what? With your balls? No thanks. See? Told ya. Having just finished high school, Colby is about to leave for LA, while Amber's planning on staying in this redneck Meshuggah quiet mountain town. If that sounds familiar, it's because this whole movie is just a Mad Libs version of the first one. Not a lot of originality in this script by Michael D. Weiss, scribe of such hallowed classics as Crocodile, Octopus, and The Scorpion King 4, The Quest for power. But at least this screenplay was directed by Sylvan White, who also did, oh god no, he made the 2018 Slenderman movie? Lots of things coming together right now. Another person planning on leaving Broken Ridge is Lance's cousin PJ, who just joined the military at the behest of his dad, Sheriff Davis. He also did it for the ladies. Chicks, dig the hair. Uh-huh. Okay, true. True. All of a sudden, their new adult goofin is interrupted by a slashing silhouette who swipes through a screen and starts swinging like a summer bitch until he slices Colby's arm. Run, everybody! Super skateboard getaway! The fisherman of lore chases after the kids with some real flashy style as they run around yelling for the whole town to get out of there. Skateboarding PJ defies a staircase and winds up on a roof where everyone below can see him. They watch as the fisherman appears and attacks PJ, who attempts a real rocket pop our escape. Let's see how good this motherfucker grinds. Oh, I think he's good. And what? Uh, nope. There you go. As the local cops are flummoxed, our quote unquote heroes are relieved. Cause turns out fishermen only came here to party, y'all. Yeah, this was just a prank, bro. Fisherman was played by their friend Roger, and Armblood was played by Ketchup. Stick ya! They celebrate a successful epic prank and talk about how PJ did a great job selling the attack. Hey, speaking of the skateboarder. Where's PJ? <laughs> that was the best cut ever. Unfortunately for all, someone moved the two very tiny gym mats that PJ was supposed to aim for, resulting in his death from being impaled upon a tractor. That's what you get for trying to prank, uh, what, j just the town in general, I guess? Everyone is disturbed and or turned into a squirrel, especially PJ's dad and his cousin Lance. The conspirators meet in a nondescript field where a familiar argument plays out. We have to go to the police. And tell them what? That it was a big joke? It was an accident. I'll let you guess what they decide to do. Go to the police or cover up their crime. Don't think too hard about it, though. It's, it's not a trick question. Especially since Broken Ridge apparently got that Southport-style extreme justice system. Small-ass town, innocent or guilty, we're dead. The dudes are the first to decide that they're gonna stay silent about it, and they win Zoe over to their side as well, overruling Amber, the only one who wants to confess to the accident. Colby replicates the arm slash that everyone saw him get in public, 
public, which is a nice touch, I'll admit, and then they make a pact and dispose of the evidence. Nothing could go wrong. It's one year later, if you can believe it, and Amber's not dealing well with her guilt over PJ's death. Cheer up, Amber. There's always barn parties to look forward to. Barn parties are great. They've got sport, dog butts, and picnic table grab ass, and music. Well, maybe forget the music. Look at the good boy! <laughs> at the barn party, Amber chats with Lance until she sees that Colby is there too. He's back in town, unannounced, because his internship in LA, you guessed it, didn't work out. They kinda break up since Colby says last summer changed things, but Amber's not ready just yet to find comfort in the arms of American badass Lance. In her room, decorated with lots of pictures on a corkboard, Amber finds an envelope addressed to her. Dun dun dun! Actually, Actually, hold the duns. The note's just from her parents, saying no sex orgies while they're out of town. Sorry, Frank the Frog, I know how you love those sex orgies. Amber wakes up later to find 50 new text messages comped onto her phone, all telling her the name of the movie that they're doing all over again, but shittier. Amber goes to see Zoe, who's the front woman of a rock band, but they definitely dubbed in Tori DeVito's singing voice, so it's hilarious to me that the sight of Amber stops her at the perfect moment. Zoe and Amber have been estranged since last year, but Amber needs her ex-friend's help figuring out who could have sent those text messages. The next day, the girls go to a ski lift where Roger works, and his re-entrance to the film is shot like he's a goddamn saw trap. Roger wants to go to the cops, having spent the past year racked by guilt, but nowadays, it's Amber who wants to keep it a secret. We had our chance to tell the truth, Roger. I'm not entirely sure why she changed her mind about that, but uh, whatever, this scene's over now. Amber and Zoe start to re kindle their friendship when PJ's dad, Sheriff Davis, swings on by to deliver the movie's best acted line of dialogue. It's gonna be tough this year. It's gonna be tough every year. That really is the best acting we're gonna see. It's all downhill from here, folks. Oh, and hey, Sheriff Davis's actor Michael Flynn is a Kill Count graduate. He was a deputy in Halloween 4 who ended up getting killed by Michael off screen. Zoe reaches out to Colby for help, only to find him dismissive. But maybe his attitude will change after he sees a threat delivered in a way that's somehow even less realistic than karaoke machine lyrics. <laughs> Fisherman should have punctuated that message with a butt print. <laughs> While mountain biking, Amber gets a flat tire, so she winds up at the ski lift where she gets a fake fisherman scare by some dude with a crowbar. The guy says there's a storm a brewing, so he sends her down on the gondola. As the night sky grows darker, Amber sees, on another gondola, a fisherman! Ooh! He then appears on top of her cart and breaks the window to get in. But he pieces out after a picture is taken of his hook hand. How'd that guy even do that? Hmm. The picture's not enough to get Colby truly concerned, but during the ensuing conversation, he does begin to suspect that Roger might be fucking with him. That's because Roger's a guilty mess over PJ's death flashing his way through all sorts of substances as he writes a suicide note and prepares to kill himself. Before he completes it, though, he hears a noise that draws him out into the warehouse, where close-up loving cam ops roam free. The fisherman pops out and attacks him, and after a very dark, very pushin' heavy chase and a little buzzsaw battle, the fisherman kills Roger with a hook swipe across the neck. The method may not be anything new, but the kill is definitely more graphic than anything from the first two movies. In fact, the one thing I can commend this movie for is a decent makeup and effects team. It involved lots of talented artists, including Greg Solomon, who also worked on Cabin in the Woods and Army of Darkness, Lance O'Reilly, who also worked on the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, and Brad Hardin, who also worked on Halloween H2O and Saw, and played this movie's fisherman in some second unit photography. Props to all of them for, you know, actually trying. The other kids show up to Roger's work slash home and find his dead body. His dead blinking body. In his little squatting corner, they find the hook and Roger's suicide note, ensuring that any cop looking into his death will just assume that he killed himself. Convenient. Speaking of cops, one named Deputy Hafner arrives and questions them briefly before letting them go. Well, before letting Zoe and Colby go. He keeps Amber back real fast so he can offer her some special protection. She's good though, dude. The three, uh, antagonists get back to Amber's house and find a grade A mess. All her 
her pictures torn up and scattered all over the damn floor. All that's left on her corkboard of memories is a single word. Soon, er, soon. The next day, they all go talk to Lance, and Colby accuses him of being behind their harassment. Lance suggests, instead, that it's probably his uncle Sheriff Davis, angry about his son's death. Lance might be onto something, y'all. That sheriff looks pissed. And that's even before he finds a note on his windshield telling him to knock it off. Who could have written that? Oh, it was Colby. He's, he's right there, Sheriff. Just... He's right there. After a super gratuitous, but also super PG-13 voyeur shot, Amber comes outside and gets bum-rushed by Lance, who tells her the name of a movie that wasn't shot on mini-DV like this one. I know what you did last summer. I don't know how this movie looks so awful when it was shot by Stephen M. Katz, who was also the cinematographer for the Blues Brothers. Why does this whole thing look like the before shots in a Claritin commercial, dude? Anyway, Lance says that he knows what they did because PJ told him before dying to the extreme! And since he's in the know, Lance is also being targeted by the fishermen. But who could the fishermen be? You know the best place to think about questions like that? A random ass pool in the middle of goddamn nowhere. Colby's swimming laps in this nowhere pool, looking like a nowhere fool, when the fisherman hooks him like a nowhere ghoul. There's some blood and some over-editing, but Colby survives and takes his busted ass foot to meet with Amber, Zoe, and Lance again. Their leading theory right now is that the fisherman is Sheriff Davis. Colby thinks they should go to Deputy Hafner for help, but when they get to his house, they run into a blue wall of silence. Silence. Hafner's got the whole PD over for cards and barbecue, so the kids are unable to openly accuse Sheriff Davis of malfeasance. Especially since the guy just came out with more beer. That'd be a major party foul, you know? On the anniversary of PJ's death, the four teens are ready to play it safe and get out of town, wearing their most 2006 outfits imaginable. The only issue is with Zoe, who has to cancel at the last minute. I just found out there's gonna be some agents at the show tonight. They book clubs all over the state, maybe even LA. Instead of leaving her on her own, Lance says they have to stick together. So it sounds like it's time for some live music. It certainly is live. While Zoe practices for the talent show, Amber shows Lance a scrapbook they made, um, at some point, of news stories that cover both the original movie and the Fligadoo sequel. He goes after them again on some island in the Caribbean. There. If only they had stopped the series there. But they didn't, so now we've got to watch these two nothing characters suck face for a little bit. Zoe's talent show is a carbon copy of the Southport Fish Queen Festival. And although Lance still wants everyone to stick together, Colby wanders off and finds a bar set left over from the local community center's latest stage play. Amber and Lance stick around to watch the crappy talent show, so they don't miss Zoe's band's performance and her obviously dubbed singing. Though Zoe won't be winning any awards from LL Cool J, Amber and Lance still congratulate her backstage after the performance. Looks like her lip syncing also floored this mannequin. Oh, wait, never mind, it's the fisherman. It's always the fisherman. He chases them through a bunch of locker rooms until, somehow, Zoe gets separated from the others and finds herself in a big storage loft or something. It's wherever this town keeps all its taxidermied animals. The fisherman catches up to Zoe and she gets a good look at who it is before he kills her by slashing her to death with his hook. Oh, wait, but is she into it? Uh, uh. Kinda sound like she into it. Amber and Lance find Zoe's body, and after a huggy bloody cry sesh, they hide in some shadows as Sheriff Davis emerges from some other shadows and finds her body as well. He hears Amber and Lance and calls them out into the light, but guess what? Sheriff Davis hasn't been the killer this whole time. So we can just go ahead and kill him right now and keep this mystery going for a little bit. Colby wakes up from his community theater bar binge, and hey, look at that, the fisherman is here. He chases him into the kitchen, where Colby manages to stick a knife in his back before running away like he's fleeing some dinosaurs. He's even got Ellie Sattler's limping foot right there. Eventually, he's caught on the hook and pulled through a little door window to die on a dirty floor. His body is later found in a dumpster by Amber and Lance, and it's one nasty, bloody-looking sitch. The kids run outside, and Deputy Hafner pulls up, eager to tell them the name of a movie that's nine minutes longer than this one, but feels a half hour shorter. I know what you did last summer. 
Bomber. He accuses them of being the killer, then they find Zoe's body in his car and accuse him of being the killer, and then finally, the real killer shows up. The fisherman takes a couple of shotgun blasts, like a total champ, and then underhooks Deputy Hafner so he can lift that guy up and impale him back first onto the prongs of a forklift. This death is probably my favorite part of the entire movie, both because of the way it's shot and because it was done using practical effects. Again, big ups to the makeup team on this movie. Amber gets into a vehicle and straight runs over the fisherman, which manages to put the guy down for a mo. But then he gets back up, and guess who the fuck it is? It's Zombie Ben Willis. I'm not shitting you. It is the undead fisherman killer from the first two movies. He's got glowing red eyes and black zombie blood, and he can even disappear into the darkness. For anyone wondering why Ben Willis is after these kids, even though they never did anything to him personally, and they live almost 2,000 miles away from Southport, uh, I don't know, I'm right there with you. What the fuck? While human Ben Willis was played by Muse Watson in the first two films, his zombie incarnation is played by stunt performer Don Shanks. You know, I try to give the fans what they want. And like I said, you know, I'm a pretty physical guy, so I like to go out and bust them up. If he looks or sounds familiar, it's because he was in my video talking to all the Michael Myers actors, having played The Shape in Part 5. Perhaps you remember his giant arms. Oh, and he was also a non-killer Santa in Silent Night, Deadly Night. Thanks, Mr. Shanks. Amber says they need to chase the fisherman down and kill him with his own hook, since that appeared to damage him. They run all the way back to their garage hangout place and rig up a trap with some chains in a pulley system, because simple machines are fun. Fisherman appears above them, pointing his hook, then appears right next to them. Wow, -ee. He throws both of them into the service pit so he can swing his hook and crotch in their faces, but they stab his foot, he disappears, they run away. Jesus Christ, this movie sucks! They get outside, and after a bunch of random fucking shots of Mother Nature, Ben Willis finally arrives for an all-too-brief hook fight! <laughs> After that, they go after him with some heavy machinery and a gun, but it's a stab with his own hook that really gets the guy screaming. Amber tells Ben to fuck off and pushes him into a, uh, a snowblower, I think, which shreds him all the shit. But I'm not putting him on the kill count, because he was already a zombie. And I learned my lesson after Zombieland. Besides, how could I count him as dead when he somehow reconstitutes himself to appear in a denouement? It takes place one year later, because this movie might as well steal that from its predecessors too, and sees a flat tire stranding Amber in an isolated mountain pass. The movie ends with her looking around for help, and the fisherman appearing behind her. How many people died in this awful fucking movie? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Six people died in I'll Always Know What You Did Last Summer, and since there was only a single lady death, we got yet another mostly blueberry pie for a movie taking place on the 4th of July. With a runtime of 92 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 15.33 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Deputy Hafner for sure. Love the practical effects, and especially the little blood shower at the end. Doll Machete's just gonna go to the rest of the movie. Yep, the whole movie. All the parts that weren't Deputy Hafner's kill. Stupid piece of shit movie. And that's it. This dump was squeezed out to video in 2006, and for anyone who's ever asked me what my least favorite horror movie is, now you know. Next week starts the Wrong Turn franchise. Finally, I know. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching The Kill Count for this shitty fucking movie. I want to thank some patrons like CJ Rocks 42 aka Burgermeister42, Michael C. Martin, Shariah George, Brandon Smith, Sushi Wolf, Andrew Morgan School, and Megan Hale 9000 Just so you know, I actually like doing kill counts on movies that I hate. This was fun to hate on. Thanks everyone, be good people.